Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you may be. Um, welcome to this second session of the uh, sub theme of, uh, for the conference on how can managing water in agriculture contribute to food security and public health. I'm Mark Smith. I'm the Director General of the International Water Management Institute based here in Colombo in Sri Lanka, and I'm going to be the moderator for this session. Um, I will have alongside me my co-moderator, Henning Bjorland, who's a um, research professor in water policy and management at the University of South Australia, and also for IWRA, the chair of the Science, Technology and Publication Committee. So just to remind uh, everybody and all of our speakers, uh, the session is being recorded. Um, we will invite uh, everybody, all participants, to submit your questions to the speakers. Uh, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you can submit your questions in English, then we will be able to answer them either verbally at the end of the Q&A, at the Q&A session at the end, or indeed I would invite the speakers to keep track of the Q&A um, uh, as, as, as they're posted and you can, you can respond also in writing. Um, and once, once um, people have responded um, uh, to any of the questions, then they will be uh, transferred uh, into the, uh, uh, they will be just displayed for everyone to see. Um, so we have um, a large audience, uh, just about 80 people I think are online. Um, so if we indeed we don't have time to answer those questions, they will be collected at the end um, and written responses posted by the presenters on the conference website uh, following today's event. Uh, please note also that the chat box is disabled during this session, um, but you may see some very useful messages flash up from the organizers uh, to help, help guide you through the session. If you do have technical problems, uh, please Google either Zoom Help Center or you can send an email to um, online.conference at iwra.org and they will be able to assist you there. Um, we have seven presentations to go through. Each, each will uh, be for 10 minutes. Um, and I'm going to introduce the first speaker now, except I saw a message flash up that indeed um, Kunal is not yet with us. Is that correct? That's correct, Mark. Okay, so what I'd like to do then is move on to our second speaker. Um, if that's all right with you, Shiva Raju, if you're ready to go. Um, so our second speaker, who will be our first speaker, is Shiva Raju Harikarana Hali Kutaya. Uh, he is an assistant professor at the Department of Water and Health at uh, JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research in Mysuru in India and will be speaking to us on water management in agricultural catchments um, and sustainable and technological approaches to pollution control. So Shivaraju, over to you, 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm Dr. Shivaraju. Uh, today I'm going to uh, uh, share some of my research findings uh, on water management at agricultural uh, catchment, especially related to sustainable and technological approach for pollution control. Next slide, please. So yes, you all know, you know, surface water management at agricultural catchment level is one of the uh, challenging environmental problems across the globe. Uh, you know, due to the multidimensional and non-point catchment sources. You know, if you see the uh, surface water uh, utility across the globe, uh, especially, uh, you know, country like India, where it is uh, using more than 80% of uh, surface water for agricultural activities. Uh, in, addition, in addition to that, uh, uh, a large number of large varieties of plant production uh, products are being used and also uh, disposing into environment and, you know, they are causing a lot of uh, problem to the uh, aquatic bodies across the country. Next, next slide, please. So if you see the practical challenges at agricultural catchment, you know, most of the pollution sources are not uh, well defined. You know, diversity in their uh, composition, especially in a 
uh, chemical composition of uh, plant production uh, products, diversity in crop pattern and diversity in soil as well as soil property. You know, it's very a uh, challenging issue to solve the uh, existing issue. Next slide, please. So in the present study, actually, uh, to solve those problems, we uh, try to design, you know, uh, we used a technological approach as well as a citizen science approach, uh, where we designed a kind of uh, char that carbon-based sorbent material to reduce the uh, pollution uh, level as well as to manage the soil fertility. And implementation of uh, this technological approach at ground level, we used a citizen science approach uh, in our study. So this is the overview of the study, what uh, uh, we conducted. Next slide, please. So actually in our present study, we uh, designed a low cost and indigenous active uh, carbon-based absorbent materials by using uh, agricultural waste with, uh, like rice husk, coconut shell, kind of paste and other waste. Uh, by using simple processes like uh, pyrolysis. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, has prepared uh, uh, sorbent material further characterized by using advanced uh, analytical technique uh, just to study their uh, functionality and uh, properties, which are all attributed towards the, uh, you know, uh, pollution remediation and uh, uh, soil nutrient management. Next, please. next slide, please. So he has prepared the uh, LCS was uh, studied at the laboratory scale as well as uh, pilot scale. Uh, this is the simple setup what we used uh, to study the uh, LCS for pollution remediation in a soil system. Uh, and we observed up to uh, 80 to 90% of pollution uh, remediation uh, at laboratory scale. Uh, next slide, please. Also, we conducted uh, pilot scale uh, in a real time field. Uh, and we have succeeded to achieve up to 80 to uh, 60 to 75 percent of pollution remediation uh, by using LCS. Next slide. Also, uh, very interestingly, uh, that LCS what we have designed uh, was uh, boosted uh, very good, boosted towards the seed uh, germination, nutrient management, and other uh, uh, feasibility in a soil system. Uh, so. It, it was acting like kind of conditioning agent uh, for uh, overall soil uh, nutrient management. Uh, next slide, please. So actually, uh, we have uh, succeeded to uh, design a good LCS uh, to uh, reduce the pollution as well as soil uh, uh, nutrient management at the ground level in a soil system, especially, you know, uh, oh, the problem what we have faced it was you know implementation of this uh, technological approach at uh, uh, real field because you know in, if you see that the Indian scenario most of the uh, farmers uh, having very small and uh, piece of land or uh, fragmented land it's very difficult to uh, switch over or adapt new approach uh, you know most of the time they're looking for you know a kind of uh, income and economic uh, perspective so. To solve that issues, to convince them, we have used citizen science with the participatory approach, where we consider various uh, components like uh, skills, education, participatory, and other things. Among these uh, component, uh, we found you know aptitude is one of the important component, uh, which is going to play a very important role uh, towards the convincing the uh, you know uh, inducers uh, here farmers. So. Very interestingly, you know, we find out uh, economic-based uh, convincing approach was very significant towards the uh, behavioral change of the end user uh, in the implementation of this uh, uh, technological approach in their uh, uh, real field. So based on that, next slide, please. Uh, based on that, we try to uh, design kind of a novel framework to understand the dynamic interaction, uh, across the water, energy, and uh, food and environmental nexus. And we uh, uh, found out that, you know, the technological approach, uh, uh, you know, citizen science a regulatory uh, component with a very potential modeling tool uh, can uh, help for sustainable management of surface water 
especially in agricultural catchment uh, during agricultural activities and all these uh, uh, component are going to uh, Uh, impact on energy utility and uh, food uh, production and all. You know, uh, these components mainly contributing a lot towards the socioeconomic uh, conditions, yield, sustainability, uh, where, you know, uh, again, uh, they're all interrelated and interdependent. Again, all these components like a social economic, socioeconomic condition, yield and sustainability, uh, mainly uh, influenced by quality of the water, you know, where a lot of, uh, pollution water pollution being contributed by agriculture from the agricultural catchment this is one of the difficult uh, area where we cannot uh, easily assess the uh, pollution water pollution or intensity of the water pollution so by adapting a kind of integrated uh, approach like a technological approach uh, including regulatory approach and citizen science uh, we can solve some some of the issues because you know Again, uh, if water quality is uh, good, you know, uh, certainly the socioeconomic uh, condition, health condition, and overall sustainability can be, uh, you know, in a, uh, we can expect in a good, uh, uh, in a good or wealthy condition. But if water quality is deteriorated, again, it is negatively impacting on socioeconomic condition and health of the uh, people. Even it is impacting a lot on food production in recent days. So next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, uh, the integrated uh, technological approach and uh, uh, citizen science, especially uh, kind of participatory approaches play a very important role uh, in solving some of the issues, the existing issues, especially water pollution in agricultural catchment. Uh, so uh, it actually, that is the major problem. Uh, it is very difficult to uh, find a perfect uh, kind of solution. So we need a lot of uh, multidimensional and integration of various uh, uh, sectors to solve the issues. Uh, thank you for your uh, attention. And I would like to thank uh, uh, organizer for giving these opportunities. It's all my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiva Raju. Um, we will move straight on to the next presenter. As, as I said at the beginning, we'll take up some questions at the end after this, all of the speakers. So let me move on to the next presenter, which is uh, Partik Kumar. Uh, Partik is the coordinator for the Water Working Group of the Revitalizing Rainfed Agricultural Network based in Hyderabad in India. So Partik, over to you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and whatever. So many thanks, Mark. Presentation, please. We see your presentation and we hear you clearly. Okay, sure. So once again, many thanks, Mark and IWRA for this opportunity. I will start with a brief about the, the, this, this study. So this was conducted recently in the COVID and the pre-COVID era. In the, in the, it was equally split during that time. And it talks about how we can rejuvenate the resilience because it goes with this belief that uh, the communities or the native uh, through their indigenous sort of their like uh, uh, cropping system and the water harvesting system as well as their governance systems, they were resilient to the climate changed to an extent, but over the time due to our policies, there was some hindrances and now they are bearing the cost. So this will talk about uh, this thing. And I work within a network called Revitalizing Rainfed Agriculture Network. And that's largely deal with the rainfed agriculture in India and looks into how the policies can be can be briefed and mold, molded in a better way where we can enhance the, enhance the agrarian livelihood. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. Yeah. 
so so this study looks mainly into the two parts one it's how the climate change had, is impacting the production of nutri cereals in the state of himachal pradesh and second how the protective irrigation can can be how the can enhance like uh, through the mountain springs and they are the localized source of the water in the himalayan regions to achieve the nutrition security and food sovereignty in the in the state and that's also within the preview of the financial viability so just in a brief about before we go ahead uh, himachal pradesh is in a small state a, a himalayan state in india uh, next slide please okay so the three factors here that are like uh, act, acting very very viciously are the climate change and agri agrarian production system and the community nutrition and the the impacted impacted sort of the section is that one that lies on the extreme marginality that include the women farmers that includes the dalits that includes the child and the pregnant women and multiple alike next slide please in himachal pradesh if we see it in the from the geographical angle only the 10% of the state total geographical area is under the uh, agriculture any sort of the agriculture or the any sort of the cultivational use also out of that area only 13% is under the irrigation so it's largely in a rain fed state within a very limited or the tiny slopes for the agriculture next slide please so in the last 30 years we see the the rainfall the monsoon that that arrives here there are the five prominent things that occurs the annual rainfall had decreased and that is a there is also a significant variation in the timing of its occurrence and the most important two things that happened is the there is an increase in the dry spells the length of dry spell had increased drastically at the same at the same point of the time the extreme event that's like the hill storm and the uh, alikes are started occurring more frequently next slide please so if we see all the two three things that i stated about the the monsoon about the rainfall and the, about the land use pattern in the himachal pradesh in complication around in in the last four decade they had um, uh, have drastically or like significantly impacted the Uh, the production system in the himachal pradesh if you see through this this uh, this graph here the total uh, land land under the food grain had had also decreased and more importantly the nutri cereals that is largely the millets or any sort of the indigenous uh, sort of like the pulses and uh, the the crops like this they have drastically either replaced or erased from the the the, the cultivation practices so and it's largely because of the extreme weather and, and uh, also the agrarian policies of the state as well as the availability of the water resources next slide please due to all this in the covid time we see there are the the casualty in himachal pradesh too like everywhere in the world but here the, in the casualty maximum of the casualty are of the sort of the comorbidity and that are either uh, related to the hypertension either related to the the uh, what we call as an a hidden hidden hunger uh, hunger where there is an a deficiency of the some of the essential uh, uh, nutritions so if we see the national family health survey uh, the, uh, the recent one of the india we found that uh, on the some of the very essential indicators that includes the anemia that 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 in, includes the blood pressure that includes the weight and the bmi and all these things the parameters aren't in the in a very good state but on the similar side himachal pradesh is among the only state in india or i will say it's it's the one of the state where every family or the 90% of the family is uh, covered under the food security uh, pds what we call it the, they they are like provided with the essential goods there and also but on the contrary side in a bigger chunk of all this uh, food security or the pds work what you call it call it as it's coming from the other state or the imported next slide please so just to meet with all these uh, uh, the issues around the health and as well as on the productivity and the production 
there is an a potential lies with the indigenous source so springs are, are the decentralized natural water uh, water sources holding the gravitational pol uh, uh, some potential so they they can they can come as in a very uh, effective uh, uh, this thing as in a filler to meet the meet the water need of the agriculture and they can help in uh, reviving the traditional or the mill millet there uh, millet in the in, in that geography and that can help in bringing the nutrition security next slide please so based on our study in in the same period of time it was uh, it was uh, like found that if we provide the uh, uh, this thing protective irrigation then the millet crops uh, they, they are like largely they are they are like a sort of the they are resilient as compared to the any any other uh, any other crop but if we pro provide them a protective irrigation through the springs we can enhance their productivity as well as we can put an a climate proofing to them so himalayan millet they also consume an around 60% less water as compared to any other major crop on on the on the same side if we use the protective irrigation to uh, bear with the, the longer dry spells or unusual uh, unusual dry spells and we use the the formula of the critical irrigation or the what we say critical stage irrigation the productivity can again be improved by 20 to 30% bearing from the land type we are growing on to and also in the next thing if we go with the springs and the protective irrigation the net potential of the enhancing the community nutrition i will say and it's largely on the iron and other essential essential indicators we can increase it by there are the potential to increase it by 15 to 25% again depending upon the upon the community its class and the caste and the multiple other factors next slide please next slide please okay so so to uh, have all these things we need to have a com comprehensive approach where there we can see into the, into the largely three sections where we need to reconfigure how we are dealing with our natural resources because as of now the springs are not in the preview of the policy or state policy to see them as in a potential source to enhance the agrarian livelihood or the the nutrition per se so we have to reconfigure our natural resources management policy as well as our production system because in our production approach also uh, the millet current consider uh, that holistically so if we revive the spring system and we revive the promote the millets also and at the same time we provide the protective irrigation through the springs we can have an a bulk of the 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 millets or the the production with us then the state policy can procure them and mainstream them and that can help us in like increasing the health as well as the happiness and the income uh, next slide please so in this comprehensive in comprehensive way we can we can achieve like an a nutrition as well as the financial viability for the state that's all from my side thank you great patrick thank you uh, in perfect time um you've really done a nice job of addressing also the theme of our sub our session today on integrating agricultural water management and food security and public health in a very interesting way thank you um just a reminder to everyone that um you can post your questions in the Q&A box that we will then be able to take up in the uh, Q&A session at the end. Um, so let's go on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Kakoli Ghosh, who is Chief Technical Advisor uh, for FAO, for the FAO Technical Cooperation Program in Saudi Arabia, and is going to present to us on integrated pathways for sustainable agriculture and rural development for smallholders in Saudi Arabia. Please, Kakoli. Um, yes, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone listening in. Thanks to Ura and everybody for giving the opportunity to present this uh, program, the project from Saudi Arabia. So I'm going to speak about the integrated pathways for sustainable solutions, particularly in a country which is heavily in, in, the, in water crisis and has a huge water scarcity issue, which is known to everybody. 
Um, and today being the topic as it is, I think it's very relevant to look at approaches which are all encompassing. And the next slide, please. Um, so basically what we are trying to look at here to give a general framework is to look for pathways which are sustainable, but the question always is how to achieve such pathways because the quest for sustainability creates tensions, creates trade-offs, and they are very hard to win, hard to find win-win solutions within the agriculture food systems. This is not something new, but this is something that we have been grappling with for a very long time, and we will continue to do so. And it is even more so in places like Saudi Arabia, where, can I have the next slide? where we have to look at trade-offs at very many different levels and the impacts of what it will be on a country which is as vast as, as this is. However, it is extremely water deficit and it is a big challenge. So you'll be surprised to find that Saudi Arabia is normally not mentioned in terms of agriculture and certainly not mentioned in terms of smallholders agriculture, but they do exist and it's a very robust form of farmers and smallholders who have been practicing their own cultivation in very interesting ways for a very long time in the country. So although Saudi Arabia, the smallhold, the land holding of agriculture is pretty small, about less than 2% of this vast country, the smallholders and the rural sector are very important for food security, for their culture, for heritage, but as we know, they face profound agriculture, agroecological and socioeconomic challenges. Of course, water is the biggest of them and the solution cannot just be water. It has to be a comprehensive solution. On the right, I have tried to list a few of the issues that they face, whether you are looking at the crop sector, livestock sector, small scale fisheries or natural resource management, which is of of course, very interesting because they have touches of forests, vast national parks, and very, very interesting aquifers and ecosystems which are very unique to the country and this particular region. So taking in mind all this, the government of Saudi Arabia, particularly the Ministry of Environment, Water and Agriculture, called as MEWA, along with FAO, formulated what is called as the Sustainable Rural Agricultural Development Program for the country, mainly to diversify the rural economy and improve food security. Now, Saudi Arabia is a very highly food insecure country because most of its food relies on imports, but there is potential to grow coffee, crops, fruits, many cash crops, and they do that. So we will be talking a little about that. Uh, next slide. So what FAO is currently doing is FAO is assisting in strengthening the Ministry of Water, Environment and Agriculture, uh, MEWA, as it is called, capacity for the implementation of this massive sustainable rural agriculture development program through a holistic integrated approach that will support rural diversification, boost food, food security and rural income. Now this particular project, of, it is about 93 million and US dollars worth of uh, investment. And there are about eight components which are directly going to be impacted through this project, including coffee, rain-fed cereals, including sorghum, millet and sesame, rose and aromatic plants, smallholders livestock, beekeeping and honey production, small scale fisheries, fruit section, and a huge bulk called natural resource management, which includes everything from water management to land desertification, sand encroachment, and so on. Now, the, the task here for FAO is to strengthen the ministry's capacity to handle these. So we are directly working with them, strengthening their policies, their approaches, their basic branch capacities, in order to be able to improve and somehow find a way how to implement this massive program that is on, on board. So next slide, it is being done through a first identification of a vast number of problems, a range of problems that were identified, 
targeting the smallholders because the focus of the project is smallholders. First of all, it's the very poor production technologies. In this context, I have to say the word poor doesn't mean they are not effective. It's just that they are very traditional and it's not meant to sort of say that they are not useful. It's just that there are far better ways now available that can improve and accelerate the development or production that they are looking for. Capacities in the institutions, again, need a vast amount of improvement, including for extension, training, you name it. There is very limited rural employment. There's a big boost from the government to particularly promote youth and women. Rural youth and women are particularly left behind. And that's another area which is long, long required. And a big, big chunk of this work is also related to finding the right data data and information, creating the baseline on which you can present and improve. And of course, provide the ministry with the tools that they need in order to advance in this direction. So how do we go about it? Next slide. Um, essentially, given the range and scale and scope of the project, it is really not possible to look at it in one bits and pieces. It has to be a cohesive, integrated approach. It has to address the ministry's concerns. It has to address, it has to be linked with what is called the Vision 2030 of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This is a huge, ambitious program of a vibrant society that has that is very much at the core of the national transformation plans. Of course, it has to be linked with the sustainable development goals because it can easily address a number of those goals. And then there is the, the food systems, which again, Saudi is very committed to, the kingdom is very committed to, and of course, we as FAO have our own strategic framework. So taking all these into, come, into account, we, are, we have just started, of course, so I can just present to you how we are looking at some solution pathways which are aligned to these commitments. Next slide. So the first pathway that we are looking at is basically an inclusive approach. We have to put sustainability at the center of delivery. And when we say inclusive, it truly has to mean inclusive across the level from the ministry, from the stakeholders, from the youth adaptation and, and find a way for the program, the project that we have to be flexible enough to adjust where and when it is needed. There are many, many targets, many, many outcomes and activity outputs and outcomes that are planned, but all this will really mean nothing if it is not inclusive and leaves no one behind. Next slide. And the second solution pathway we have put in is to adopt in order to get there is to adopt a 360 degree view, meaning addressing all the cross cutting component cross cutting areas for all these components. What are these cross cutting areas you might ask? Well, first of all is capacity building at an institutional and and, and a sub institutional level at the center that's in the in the headquarters and in the branches and the offices in within the villages and in the rural areas. Second is a value addition. We are focused on value addition across all the nine, eight components that I just mentioned. Value addition is more than value chain development. It includes marketing. It includes agribusiness related incubation centers for youth and women. It includes value chain development, of course and developing appropriate business models for that. There is another area of research and extension, which is extremely important and very necessary if we have to make any difference whatsoever in future for sustainability. And all this to be encompassed within a farming system approach where we are looking at what are the various farming systems available? What are the areas where you have to address this in a critical manner to gather the data? Now, when I say how we are looking, we are connecting all these with our people who are available. And I have one more slide to go if allowed, or I can stop here. So the third one is, um, is to build the local capacities and where we need to build local capacities. Again, within the ministry itself is for systematic data and information gathering for systematic tools available for strengthening local capacities 
for raising awareness and for enabling innovations. Once again, because it is linked with the government's plan, digitalization is one of the major areas of thrust, but not only because we have to think broader in a cohesive manner. And this particular map I wanted to put here is to show the agroecological zones of Saudi. We are looking at a vast diversity, which is sometimes overlooked, given that we are not thinking in terms of the rural and the smallholders who are part of Saudi. So again, we have just started some of our situation and sector analysis have showed there's a tremendous areas where we can provide inputs and provide support to the government for enabling innovations, alliances, governance and compliance. I hope in future I can be able to present some more interesting data from you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kakoli. Um, thank you very much for the uh, clear presentation on what, what's going on with your program in Saudi Arabia. Uh, let's move on to our next speaker, uh, which is Professor Sirus Jafari, um, who is from the Soil Sciences Department of the um, University of Khuzestan in Iran. Um, and uh, we have a presentation from him on um, Adaptation strategies and barriers to water scarcity, qualitative analysis in southern Iran. Sirus, over to you. Hi, thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. And uh, I appreciate all the participants and the organizer. Uh, our research was uh, introduced by uh, Dr. Smith, and uh, I will explain about uh, our research uh, just for 10 minutes. Uh, huge body study and report worldwide include confirm that both of the case in worldwide term which attribute to temporary shortfall in water resource and margin to meet water needed. Uh, first, uh, next slide please. When a large number of people in area on water uh, insecure for insufficient period of the time when we can call the area water scale. The weather and uh, area qualifier but water scale dependent on, for instance, the how people need or the define the weather, the need the environment and water for the nature and taken account of the definition. What fraction of resources is made available or would be made available to satisfy and this needed temporal and special scale need to define scarcity. The Iranian agriculture sector had the severely affected by climate change frequently and prolonged drought case, the severe water shortage had led to sanitization and desertification of arable land. Adaptation and agriculture. Adaptation as ability system to adjust to uh, response to actual expert uh, please previous uh, adaptation uh, expand climate uh, stimuli to moderate harm to crops with the consequence agriculture adaptation to climate change referred to adjustment of the farm farming system to response uh, next please a slide actual and anticipate climate and non-climatic stimuli and condition in order to avoid to alleviate related risk and release the potential opportunities. Uh, this is a sample of the concept to attribute and type and K measure to an example. Uh, please, next one. Theoretical model and the research approach. Health brief model, health, health belief model, or HPM was emergent the social psychologist. It is the most common and most popular theoretical model to help from <coughs> promotion behavior. And the uh, reserve health behavior and focus on people believe about their decision. In this model, treat pre uh, precipitation and behavior evaluation are two main components. Treat Perception and component include two sub components, which are the 
specific susceptibility and anti-cepiate severity. Behavioral evaluation component consists of two sub-components, which are the receive benefit and receive barrier. Uh, as shown in this slide, we can two part of the main component self-efficiency and cause of the action that we evaluate the adaptation behavior. Next, please. Material and method. Uh, the main purpose of this study investigating uh, perception and partner risk of the water scarcity and identification, main adaptation strategy and barrier to water scarcity in South Iran. Traditional agriculture system in microwave agriculture is done by surface method. Due to application of quantitative approach to this study from the semi-structure in depth, interviewer to better understand farmers' uh, perception of the risk strategy and barrier to their adaptation uh, with residents of Dashtasan region in south of Iran in uh, Gosher province, agriculture area with climate recent drought in the south Iran. To analyze results, we used the HPM model has been used to the possibility of inter pairing adaptive behavior based on two dimensions of this model, namely farmer risk precipitation and how farmer resp uh, respond to the water scarcity. Choose this model because of the opportunity capability include the ability to access risk precipitation and modify adaptive behavior in field environment and the respective power. Limit, limited of quantity research, mod, uh, methods have determined orientation to qualitative instruction, which are more reliable to certain circumstances. Please, next one. The result of the data analysis show our the adaptation strategy to water escapee was the main component in water resource management and technical management and power risk management. The maximum effect was belong to technical management about the 70, uh, and the minimum was belong to farm risk management around the 8%. Uh, for the subdivision of the sub component, we show in the right table uh, increase of the use animal manual choosing irrigation system to drip plant pest control is the maximum effect and the lining irrigation panel and canals was the minimum effect of the sub component division next please and the adaptation barrier to water scarcity was to main component institutional economic and social uh, that was in person uh, calculated for this evaluation in the economic in the middle, but the social is the maximum and the situational in the minimum component. And the subcomponent in this uh, and subcomponent in this evaluate, we can see in the right table uh, for the lack of the support from the government and responsible situation was the maximum effect and the lack of the effective facility is the minimum effect on this the adaptation barrier of the water scarcity. Conclusion, we can, next one please. Uh, before the explain about the conclusion, it should be noticed that this study was conducted in the ritual owner uh, with the low technique agriculture and uh, with the surface irrigation method. Based on the data on the result, most far farmers confirmed that the water scarcity had occurred in this area and express indicator that this phenomenon was occur occurring based on the local experiment gain over the past years. Based on the analysis, most of adaptation a strategy used as the farm technical management. Efforts have been made to adapt using the uh,
methods such as the change in the irrigation system and increasing the use of animal manure. Also, barrier to farmer adaptation was a social component. Also, the main barrier adaptation mentioned by farmer were lack of the government support, financial problem, and administrative problem. These results highlight the need to policy marker policy marker to recognize drought in this area and provide a situation and legal facility for development of adaptive methods in this area. Also need to pay attention to the impact of the social dimension of adaptive behavior can guide policy marker. Adaptive sustainable approach will help to development of agriculture sector. At the end, our university and research team announced that we'll cooperate with the research institute and group present to conference on the agriculture and environment issue. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, paying attention. And I apologize for uh, the simple slide and uh, for uh, not good pronunciation in English. Thank you. Uh, not at all, Sirus. Your presentation was very clear. Thank you. Um, okay, let's let's continue. But before we do, I just want to acknowledge that uh, our speaker Kunal Sharma has joined us now, who was meant to be our first speaker. So just Kunal, we'll put you in at the end after Enrique. Okay, so you'll come in at the end. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next speaker, uh, who is Chloe Van Biljon who is a research analyst with IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, based in South Africa. Um, the, her presentation is the WASH small-scale irrigation linkage, insights from rural Ethiopia. Chloe. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for having me today. It's very nice to be a part of the session today. I'll be presenting some research we've been doing to try to understand how irrigation, um, specifically small scale irrigation is linked to the water sanitation and hygiene of a household. Um, in this paper, we specifically looked at Ethiopia and this research is part of a larger project, um, part of the USAID's Feed the Future Innovation Lab for Small Scale Irrigation. You can go to the next slide, please. So, we know that irrigation can influence nutrition, health outcomes, and food security through several potential pathways, such as the income pathway, a productive pathway, a women's empowerment pathway, and a water supply pathway. And many of these pathways have been well researched. And in this paper, we wanna focus specifically on how multiple water use of irrigation sources can improve an irrigate, uh, household's water supply and water access and through that affect their, their wash outcomes, and then finally, potentially their health outcomes. Next slide, please. So the first thing we, we wanted to look at is if we see sort of any um, interaction between a household's irrigation practices and their domestic water practices. So we had a look at households, um, domestic and irrigation water sources, and we saw that when we look at, um, for example, here, the surface, um, the households that use surface water for their domestic source, a large proportion, nearly 80% of those also use surface water for their irrigation source. And similarly, when we look at the ground, um, the, the households that use groundwater for their domestic source, um, about just over 70% of them also use groundwater for their irrigation source. So we find that Households are, um, we see an interaction between their, their irrigation and domestic water sources, and we speculate that these, these sources might affect each other. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, next, we wanted to just very descriptively compare how irrigators and non irrigators um, um, compare in their, their wash outcomes. So, the first thing we looked at was the water supply. Here we're using the UNICEF and um, World Health Organization's joint monitoring program indicators. And we found that um, quite a large proportion of households in our sample have basic water, have access to basic water supply. Um, this is defined as having a improved water, yeah, improved water access within 30 minutes of your household, 30 minute round trip. 
And um, we see that a larger proportion of, of um, irrigators have such access and a smaller proportion of irrigators compared to non irrigators rely on only surface water. You can go to the next slide, please. Then when we look at sanitation, we see that um, in our sample, a large proportion, over 20% of households have no toilet facilities at all. Um, and only over about 30% of them have basic toilet facilities, which is um, an improved facility that is not shared with another household. Um, we don't see large differences between irrigators and non-irrigators on this domain. You can go to the next slide, please. Um, and then finally, hygiene. Um, you'll see that um, a very small proportion, um, about 4% of, of households um, have basic hygiene um, access, which is a hand washing facility that has both soap and water. So that's quite concerning. Um, and then we see that actually a slightly larger proportion of irrigators have no hand washing facility at all. Next slide, please. So what for our analysis, we wanted to sort of um, go deeper, not only look at irrigators as non-irrigators, but to look at the sort of multiple water use um, elements. So what we did is we, we split our sample into various groups. We first um, split by irrigation status um, and then by irrigation source. And then finally, we, within each irrigation source, we, we have a question within our survey that asks the household, not only whether it's the same type of um, source that they use for the domestic purposes, but if it's the, exactly the same source. Um, so we could split the households into those that use exactly the same water source um, for both their domestic and irrigation purposes, and those that use different sources. Um, so our various, our, our groups of interest are households that use the same groundwater source for both irrigation and domestic purposes. Then we have households that use the same surface water source for both, for both domestic and irrigation purposes. Households that use different sources for domestic and irrigation and then non-irrigators. You can go to the next slide, please. So our methodology um, focuses around three different models. Our variable of interest is domestic as multiple water use status. It's the, the groups I've just outlined in the previous slide. And our outcomes um, focus around different, different um, wash elements. So we have things like um, total time per week fetching water, um, sufficient, whether a household reports having sufficient water available for domestic use. Um, we look at their hand washing practices, their hand washing facilities, the sanitation facilities, and finally, diarrhea in children. Um, and then our three models are as follows. We use, a, to start, we just use a pooled OLS, um, or in the case of a binary outcome, this is just simply a linear probability model. Our second model is a household fixed effect model. Our, our data is a panel data set. So um, in this model, we, we compare the households of the two different waves, um, and this model, the advantage is that we can control for time invariant um, factors, but the disadvantage is that we'll only be using households that change in this, this their water use status over the two waves, which is a, a smaller and more limited sample. Um, and then finally, we have an instrumental variable model where we use time to the closest water source as the instrument. Uh, and we believe that this instrument is significantly correlated to a household's um, water use status. But um, given the way that land is allocated to households um, in these Ethiopian districts, we don't believe that it's significantly correlated to um, confounding factors such as households wealth. And then we have a range of other controls that we use to try to control for anything else that we think might confound our effects. Next slide, please. So we have a few different findings. Um, we find that um, groundwater irrigators spend less time fetching water. Um, this is partly because um, 
we find that their water sources are much closer to their households. Um, but they do, and they do make more trips than other households given these close sources. But once we look at how many trips they make and how long the trips take, we still find that they spend a lot less time fetching water compared to um, our other groups of interest. Next slide, please. Um, we find that um, we have some indication that non-irrigators might have poor hygiene. Um, when we looked at the households reporting whether they wash hands their, their hands before handling food, we see that non-irrigators are less likely to um, report doing so. Um, and this effect is significantly different compared to um, ground source households, households that use the same ground source for domestic and water purposes. But it's not significantly different to um, households that use surface water or different sources. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and then finally, we find that um, households that report using the same ground, same ground source for domestic and water and domestic and irrigation purposes um, are more likely to report having sufficient water available for domestic use compared to non-irrigators. Um, you'll see that there a higher proportion of them that report having so compared to all the other groups, but this difference is only significantly different to non-irrigators. And we see that for this group, we have 90% of households that report that they do have sufficient water available for domestic use. Next slide, please. So to um, summarize our findings, um, we do have some evidence that um, there's multiple water use of productive and domestic water, um, particularly for groundwater irrigators, um, who we find are more likely to use the same groundwater source. Um, we have some evidence that non-irrigators have worse hygiene, but um, we want to dig into this to get more evidence. Next slide, please. And then finally, um, we have some evidence that irrigation does contribute to improved water access. Um, we find that these ground source households um, spend less time fetching water per week, but however, this result wasn't um, robust to different model specifications. Um, and then finally, we do find that um, these ground source households are more likely to report having sufficient water available for domestic purposes. Next slide. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for your attention. And um, we don't have to show this. This is just in case anyone would like the definitions. Okay, Chloe, thank you very much. Um, very, very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, before we move on to the next presentation from Enrique, just a reminder. Um, yeah, please, if you have questions, we've got 100 people on this on this call. There must be some questions that people have. So please put those in the Q&A box and we'll take those up in the Q&A session. So our next speaker is Enrique Fernandez Escalante. Uh, Enrique is a hydrogeologist with the Traxa Group and he's also the co-chair of the IIH Commission on Managed Aquifer Recharge. Uh, he's going to speak to us on industrial and environmental managed aquifer recharge related water security cases contributing to food security and public health. Over to you, Enrique. You're on mute, Enrique. I'm very sorry. Uh, I was saying thank you, Mr. Smith, for so kind introduction and good day, ladies and gentlemen. Next, I am going to expose you for cases uh, of MAR in Spain. Can we pass to the next slide? Calum, please. Um, um, so, uh, for MAR related industrial and environmental cases to check whether or not MAR is a key element for food safety and public health. Next, please. So all these cases and two of them has been selected because they are industrial related, water security 
cases, and the other couple of environmental water security. In all of them, MAR is implemented as an integrated water resources management component that guarantees environmental water security. This is a little advance of the final conclusions. It is also a climate change adaptation measure, not, in, not a topic not included in this presentation, but important to outline it, and also in an irrigation area and um, also regarding the mark concept, it contributes to food safety. Please uh, allow me introducing these four cases, uh, each of them. Next slide, please. The first one is located in El Carracillo Shield in Los Arenales Aquifer, a huge aquifer in Castilla León in the central part of Spain. This aquifer has um, suffered a groundwater level depletion of about one meter per year since the year 1972. In the year 2002, mar activities began with um, a recovery of the water table of about 24 centimeters per year until the, the current days. So the indicator to track the evolution is the groundwater storage in the in this aquifer. Next, please. So in this field, it, uh, MAR is the driving force of the local economy. About 50% of the hectares are in irrigation and 80% of the vegetables production of the whole province is produced in this shield. The groundwater extraction is about um, MCNs per year and the 24% of this irrigation volume is coming from intentional recharge from MAR. Let me mention some economic indicators regarding this region. The employment is triplicated in respect to the whole region. The population is rising about 6% since the year 2000 in comparison to the whole region that is decreasing. And the productivity of certain crops is being duplicated, even triplicated. Next, please. The second um, case is the Alcazar and Pedrajas Satmar, also in Los Arenales Aquifer, in the neighbor province in Valladolid. It is an example of water quality variations depending on the wise combination of different sources for mar with the stakeholders' intervention, introducing the term co-managed aquifer recharge. The problem is equivalent to the previous one, to the neighbor area, that the groundwater table declines about 15 meters in 30 years. And the solution was the implementation of a SATMAR experience to guarantee the aquifer sustainability, the irrigation in the area, and the agroindustry permanence. Next, please. So the main novelty in this experience is that water is coming from three different sources, from the Piron River diversion, from the rooftop water in the Pedrajas village. It is conducted to the connection point across a mar channel and then advanced secondary was water treatment plant. So the operativity is independent from surpluses and permissions. Dilution as a solution to pollution is applied. Is, and this is a usual term that I don't like very much, but in this case, wisely combining the different sources, we can guarantee the allowance the standard for, of quality for MAR according to the regulations. There are some post-treatment actions, either artificial or nature-based solutions using the aquifer as a purification element. The system is natural and passive. It doesn't require any electricity. It is a, uh, an example of circular economy and it is a long-term applicable technology. Next, please. The third case, and my favorite, is the use of MAR to decrease the floods devastation effect on crops and food production on the eastern coast of Spain in, in Valencia. There is drilled a huge marble hole from an irrigation pond, and it is used only when an overflow concurs, enhancing water security. So this borehole is capable of um, percolating inside the cars about 100 liters per second during the flood, um, during any overflow. Therefore, the flood peak re is reductive uh, using the, the Roman principle of divide et impera or divide and conquer. So in this hydrogram, we can realize of the reduction in the area of the hydrogram and the devastation effect on the 
left slides is reduced in 50,000 tons. So the KPI in this case is the amount of water detracted from a flood and rapidly, very rapidly, in less than a day, converted into groundwater. Next slide, please. And the fourth case, Celeste, uh, is in Aravallona, in Salamanca, also in the central part of Spain, where MAR is, uh, is used to reduce the disturbing presence of surface water in agricultural areas with drainage problems affecting the food production. In this case, we can see in these slides how water is stored in the surface affecting the evolution of the crops. It is drained and conducted to a neighbor part of the aquifer. So the natural situation is MAR becomes a complementary technology for aquifer storage. The food production is resulting increase and there is a certain nitrates impact. It is obvious we have to mention everything, pros and cons. So the KPI in this, can, in this case, sorry, will be the balance between the surface water and the groundwater storage. Enrique, you seem to have gone on to mute again. Sorry, I am taking the mouse away because I am used to, to click myself. Okay, I was uh, going to talk about the results. So in the first case, the impact on the irrigation area is translated as a rise of the population and even a triplication of the crops production, for example, for the watermelon and for the sweet melon. In the second case, the reuse of water is key for food production and also is improving water quality standards with at least an improvement of 18 parameters and also the groundwater availability. In the third case, the amount of water detracted from floods is huge. We are reducing is in about 50,000 tons of water, the devastation effect of these floods running through the crop lands direct to the, to the sea. And in the fourth case, the drainage area with MAR is a good thing because we are reducing the stress and we are increasing the defect in a neighbor aquifer. So therefore the production is increased in both areas. Can we pass to the next slide? So uh, as conclusions, MAR is a IWRN technique but, and should prioritize the urban water supply. It is sad, sad to say this, but it must be like this. Intermittent MAR systems do not guarantee 100% water security because they have a higher, a high degree of uncertainty as depends on weather. The sad MAR cases is the only chance of the 24-7 water availability for intentional recharge, but the quality must be permanently monitored. Solutions might be achieved in a bottom-up approaches into multi-level governance, organizational schemes, and enhancing the spaces of trust, involving at least, at least water authorities and the stakeholders. Water security is also jeopardized by economic interests, regulation barriers, and conflict of interests. And the most important conclusion is that multi-level governance the bottom-up decision support systems, the COMAR and the PPPP, are improving IWRIN, water security, food safety, and public health. Next slide, please. Before my far, farewell, just to recall all, all of you, please, that the, there is a commission on managing aquifer recharge inside the IAH. There is a mailing list. Everybody is welcome to participate either you are a member in the association or not. Thank you very much for your kind attention and thank you organizers for this slot. Great, thank you Enrique, fascinating thank you. Uh, case studies, thank you. Um, so before we get to the Q&A, let's go back to um, Kunal Sharma, who was scheduled to be our first speaker, but is with us now. Um, so Kunal uh, is a consultant engineer uh, with the NABCONS consultancy based in Assam in India. 
and is going to speak to us on sustainable spring watershed management systems in the Indo-Himalaya region. Uh, so Kunal. So giving this opportunity, uh, giving this platform, here uh, I am here to discuss the uh, sustainable spring watershed management system in the Indo Himalayan region. Where the what the village community facing the challenges and this uh, planning planning approaches to overcome these challenges. So myself Kunal Sharma, I am basically a consultant in Nepcons and now in Guwahati, and my co-author is Dr. Nirban Nasrpur. He is assistant professor in Mizoram University. Can you go to the next slide, sir? Next slide. Yeah. So, purpose of sustainable spring watershed management system. So, basically, uh, in the Himalayan region and also in, in if you uh, consider northeastern region, most of the households are solely dependent on the spring water, even for the drinking, uh, washing, and uh, agriculture sector. They are solely dependent on the spring sheds. So now, now due to the uh, effect of climate change and the uses of plastics and then cutting of trees, the, the uh, discharge in the spring is decreased. So we need, need to, uh, we need to do some small phone intervention so that we can increase the discharge in the springs. So for that, uh, we need to identify the recharge area. Uh, when we identify the recharge area, we can uh, go for the some small small interventions. We divide the small small intervention into structural measures and non-structural measures. So basically, yeah, to ensure the water security in the villages and in the Himalayan region, to ensure the livelihood standard of the village areas and in the Himalayan region. These are the mainly purpose of sustainable spring water management system. Challenges. Water source is located in a little far from the, uh, from the settlement. Uh, most of the time, the springs are located in a far, far from the uh, habitation area. So the villagers are go, uh, go in a very distant places to fetch the water. Uh, this will take more time and, and, and also these will impact the you know, kitchen gardening and other agriculture practices because they, 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 used to, they used to wait in a long queue to, to fetch the water because the discharge is less. Most of the cases the discharge is less. So the spring is very low. Spring is not easily accessible. Spring is not easily, um, uh, villagers cannot easily go to the uh, spring chambers. And in some cases, there is no spring chamber, so they'll collect the water directly from the spring. So it is also an, uh, one of the difficult, difficult for the uh, villagers to collect the water from the spring. No government water supply scheme. Basically, there, is, uh, there will be due to the topography of the area, uh, there is no pipe water supply schemes in most of the villages in, uh, in Meghalaya and also in the northeastern region of India. There is a, uh, no pipe water supply schemes low agricultural output and income opportunity and all due to the scarcity of water there is also the agriculture output is very less in that particular region constant extinction of spring and spring fed resources so uh, using the constant uh, spring water from the from the particular so this will be, uh, decrease the decrease the water level in particular spring because uh, the area doesn't have constructed any spring chambers uh, so the spring discharge is less so this will uh, this will create problem for the villagers. Drop in stream flow, increase in risks in water uh, water security with the raising demand. As because the demand is increases, population is increases. So it will increase. so these are basically the structural measures that we can we can do in the in, in the spring area and also in the in the recharge area uh, to store uh, to store the water and this water will infiltrate uh, into the ground. So basically, spring chamber yeah, it is basically it helps to store the water from the spring. And discharge the surplus water to the nearest pedigree. So this is one of the approach uh, we can construct a, a spring chamber so, that, so so as to store the uh, water and the, and then and the and the discharge this this water directly into the agriculture stream. Dugout surface runoff water stored and percolates into the ground. We can uh, we can do uh, in the recharge area we can do the dugout small small dugouts and whatever the rainwater that, that will that will that, that will store in the dugout and then it will infiltrate into the ground so these are the small small intervention that, that we need to do uh, to increase the stream discharge uh, it will uh, then rooftop recharge media this is another intervention that we can go because uh, the uh, the scenario is something like that if uh, our recharge area may be in the habitation area so we can we can can't go for the uh, dugout or other other interventions dug out trenches this this intervention is not possible so uh, we can what we can do we can go for the rooftop recharge if this is a habitation area then we can go go for the rooftop recharge so that the rainwater can 
collect the excess rainwater and this rainwater can easily uh, recharge into the recharge pool. So this is one of the uh, alternative to inflate the water. This is the contour trenches. Contour trenches we can do. Then afforestation. Afforestation is one of the one of the major practices that we need we need to do in the recharge area. Uh, sampling of fruit trees and high value forest trees may encourage the local people to do more forestation in the recharge area because the economic condition of the local people is not so good. So if we uh, provide them a sampling of fruit trees and other high value forest trees. Then they will get the encourage and do the uh, do the uh, afforestation in the recharge area. This will help the uh, groundwater uh, storage. Then non-structural measures. This is also very important because uh, this uh, this all the spring sheds are in a very remote area and the community con contribution is uh, required. So awareness generation program. Uh, a one awareness generation program is required to to know, to 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 elaborate the uh, entire project to the villagers. And, they, and 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 to increase their their participation in because this is the main uh, main uh, scenario if the community contribution community contribution is required at their end and for that awareness generation program is the one of the most uh, plays one of the most vital role formation of water user groups yes and the spin shed community so uh, in that we can form a small small water water user groups um, uh, whoever the beneficiaries from these spring spring chambers we can form the small small water users groups these water user groups uh, may uh, may do the operation maintenance of the spring areas, and we can form a spring shed committee. Uh, we can form the uh, one spring shed committee to look after the entire springs in the uh, in, of the particular village. Because uh, maybe in one village there have a two or three springs are there. Users are different, but uh, we can form a small small water user groups along with the spring shed committee, so that they can go for the whatever the intervention that they are uh, proposing. They will they, they will do. Livelihood activities, yeah. Uh, we we have, we can do in addition to that. If you provide some livelihood activities like beehives, or we can provide the poultry farming, figure these kind of livelihood activities encourage the people to go to go and uh, to go and, and do the whatever the uh, whatever the necessity for the community to participate in the in this program. So livelihood activities is one of the of the major rules. Then employment generation. The local people we can uh, whatever the structural measures that we have, we can uh, we can we can utilize these uh, local people for the employment generation as a mandate basis, uh, so that so that people participation and ownership will increase. Operation maintenance plan. We we need to develop an operation maintenance plan. That, that plan uh, may may have may have the uh, entire thing entire action plan that how the spin shed committee members and water user groups will maintain the project. Uh, after the implementation, because uh, the maintenance is required, approach and use the address of the issues. Science-based assessment of the spring shed and identification of the research area is very important. Community participation is very important. Good quality of whatever the structural interventions are there, they should be a good quality. Good management and supervision of work done. And the transparency in project implementation and financial matter. There should be a transparency in the project implementation and financial matter with the local local community. Support from external government and other agencies. We can uh, we can uh, go for the support from the external government and other agencies to convert in some fund for operation maintenance or for providing some livelihood activities to the villagers so that they will um, they will get more encouraged and they will participate in this project. A spring shed or spring catchment usually comprises of severely affected streams and different orders. Forest and rangeland destroyed in or in good condition. Hillside farming area. Low cropland areas and habitation area. These are basically the areas where the spring shed and spring catchment usually comprise. So rooftop recharge. Uh, this is basically one of the technique in the uh, that we can adopt in the uh, in the habitation area. So in that particular uh, particular rooftop rainwater harvesting, infiltration roof water into the aquifers before it's lost in the surface, and it, it, it is being used in the houses within the recharge area. Because of most of the coagulated roofs are sloping, gutters are connected and to the edges and then catch the water and draining from the slope roof. PVC pipe function as a gutter. The PVC pipes are installed in it. The rainwater may simply convert into the recharge pit using these PVC pipes. Incorporating the roof water into the surface and aquifers in a, is a technology breakthrough. A pipe is also linked with the gutter so that the beneficiaries can collect the rainwater in, into the collecting chamber during the rainy season. And when their ch chambers are full, the beneficiaries Hold the north pipe so that the rainwater collects straight into the recharge pit. So this then interventions, uh, geological mapping of the village is required, recharge area demarcation, 
water discharge uh, data collection monthly basis here we can uh, we can uh, we can utilize our local resources and the, the whatever the local resources are there we can give them training and make them para hydrology so that they will do the uh, they will do the whatever the data collection is there and maintain for, for the maintenance and the data collection and awareness they will do that so we will uh, we will form one water user group and from this water user group we will one after one or two person as a para hydrologist and we can, can give them training then water water quality same thing analyzes the water quality quality data on regular basis formation of water management committee and water user groups estimation and planning for recharge activities recharge structures are towards construction and vegetable measures plantation then special uh, social fencing for recharge area um, the social fencing is also required for the recharge area because uh, entire fencing it will it will, it will have uh, more cost so social fencing is one of the uh, one of the alternatives you can offer for that Crop weather calendar. Almost two decades, the Indian Meteorological Department created this district level crop weather calendars based on the typical weather and crop water requirement for key cereal pulses and oil seed crops. Later, IMD amended them by including current cropping patterns, soil types, and the pest and disease control conditions. So, next slide. The major goal of water planting process is to ask the community to create. Yeah, hello. For now, sorry, uh, we're going to need to wind up. So if you can just finish up in the in a in the next few seconds, please. Yeah, yeah. So uh, basically, community uh, community based capacity building on water budgeting is very important. Institution must be allowed to clear the rule and duty capacity building in grassroots levels. The most effective uh, option is micro micro level planning for water budgeting, which will lead to the water security. Water reserves must be planned in the long term in order to ensure the sustainability for recharging. Ensuring ability from uh, surface sources during the times of water scarcity. So, can you go to the next slide, sir? Uh, basically, the public engagement will uh, uh, will and clean and develop the ownership to contribute the long term viability of the project. Uh, water resource restoration and maintenance should be ongoing process. So, local people uh, should, be, uh, should be taught to manage their sources. This is the one of the most important. Uh, water body restoration and repair can be lead to the increase there. Water is optimal use of spring and water resources. This is one of the factor. The stick surveillance, to, uh, stick surveillance water storage management is equally crucial in this, this water ability. It's the aided provision of food security, bottom of the institutional framework, and resource management is long term and successful. Okay, we better stop there. Uh, thank you, Kunal. Um, thank, you, thank you very much. Okay, um, we have a very few minutes left for a few questions. So I'm going to hand over to Henning. Uh, to take us through those. Henning. Thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you to all the speakers for an uh, excellent presentation. It was a wide range of uh, very interesting papers. Um, there's only one a question in the Q&A box, but I noticed that the other presenters have not been able to put questions in there. So while we get the answer to the question in the Q&A box, if you can think about a question, your other presenters, then feel free to ask it online afterwards, otherwise I have some questions. The one question in the box is for Enrique Fernandez Escalante on the managed aquifer recharge. And the question is, for Ma, are you recharging the aquifer upstream or downstream of agriculture? Over to you, Enrique. Okay, thank you for the question. And the four cases exposed are Mar for agriculture. So in this case, we are recharging water at the heading of the groundwater set. So okay, upstream, you. the direct uh, Sorry, no. response will be upstream. Thank you. Thank you. Does any of the other presenters have questions? If so, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Sirius, you have unmuted, do you have a question? Yes, okay, I can. Could ask a question. Uh, no, no, I don't have asked any asked question. Okay, I, I, good. I just, Thank you very much. Okay. Then um, I would like to ask Kumar a question, if I could. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. I noticed that um, the production of millet decreased significantly more than other grains. I can see the logic in all kinds of productions going down because of the drought and the increased heat, et cetera, et cetera. But why have millet 
actually is significantly more than grains, considering that millet uses less water, could millet is a lot more nutritious, so should in a sense be eaten in preference. Uh, I think this must be to me. Uh, I'm not yeah. mistaken. Yeah. So, so the one one broad region behind the millets, it's the, one is the climate, climatic first perfect rain in multiple others. At the same time, state also because in the last slide, as I said, the state withdraw towards the uh, the millet production. It's all put its all incentive towards the rice and the wheat. Name of the food security. Uh, they 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 take away the nutrition state. So what happened? All the subsidies, all the all the all the sort of the input, all the research in, on the on in the same forty year period, it, it's diverted towards the uh, the rye wheat in in place of the millet. So millet doesn't only uh, failed uh, just because of the climate change. Because at the same time the the state policy also failed to provide any sort of the spread to uh, any any sort of the uh, support to the millet cultivation. That's 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 the one one additional reason to that. Do you know why that is and what your logic is from the state's perspective? That's largely on the name because in India in the 1950s and 60s, India was going through the conjugative droughts. So at that time, the the logic was the rice, rice, the productivity and and everything is huge. So if we go for the rice and the wheat, that's how we can bring the food security in the country. Food security came at the cost of the nutrition security. That's all I, 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 I can say at this point. Good. I, I kind of knew that. I just wanted to spell it out. <laughs> Thank you. Are we out of time, oh, Mark? Okay. Uh, there's a big bus with the stick. Are you going to finish? I think we are out of time, yeah. So let me wind up. Thank you, Henning. Uh, and thank you for uh, that last question, which is it's a really interesting example. As I said in my remarks after uh, Patrick uh, finished speaking of, of that indeed illustrates the theme that we've been talking about. So we've, we've had a, a really good session, in fact, two sessions, looking at um, how health, food and water are part of one system. And indeed, uh, agricultural water management does provide a, a range of of levers really for managing that system. Um, so please, I'll refer everyone to the conference website where you'll be able to find um, uh, more information about this theme. There are also a set of posters that you can see on the website, including posters uh, relevant to this theme. Uh, indeed, if you have questions about these posters, you can send those to the poster authors by email um, at the email address online.conference at IW. Uh, ra.org um, and the, the uh, organizers will relay your questions to the poster authors. Um, you'll find also there a recording of the video